Um, so it's a great joy to be um, introducing Mag tonight um, and her new book. And I can tell from many of the faces in the audience that this is a kind of gathering of friends and family who have supported Mag's work for a long time. Um, two things brought me and Mag together. This is my story, Mag. You may have a different version. <laughs> two things brought us together. One was Dharma, the Dharma, and one was writing. So the Dharma, uh, I was way back in the early 2000s, I was the centre manager for Taos Mountain Sangha and the Taos Mountain Hermitage, mm -hmm. and uh, you were running in that wild circle too, <laughs> Mag. Um, Mag is a long time uh, Dharma practitioner, especially with uh, Spirit Rock, and so we kind of cross paths a lot. But I think the relationship uh, dropped in a little more when Mag was teaching, Mag has taught at uh, colleges in California and in New Mexico, and she was teaching at UNM Taos, and while she was going off on one of her travels, probably one of the travels that she has written about in this beautiful book, she asked me to come in and cover some of her creative writing classes. So I got to see then just exactly how dedicated she was to her students, how thoughtful, and caring she was in her service to her students as I stood in for a few weeks for her there and our relationship kind of went to a deeper level. So Dharma and writing also are the things that brought her back into my life in a stronger way a few years ago when she started talking about wanting to write this memoir about her travels and her her Dharma experiences and then going out into the world with her family history and her practice background and exploring the world in a, in a very rich way. And I saw how, as a companion on the journey, as Mag was writing this book, I saw how, the thing is when you're writing memoir, it's very easy to fall into the romantic pattern of what you think your story is. Uh, the old tropes, the, the pretty version, the nice story <laughs> that makes you look good and all of this. And I saw how, Mag really dove into a very deep exploration, constant challenging to bring her own tender heart to her family story and what she was experiencing in the world and to bring a very sensitive level of understanding to open up new insights and new explorations in the story she was telling. And I have great admiration for that, Mag. I really do. And not everybody can do it, and she did a beautiful job of it, which is, the result, the result is this book, um, which we are just about to hear from. And Sean Murphy, would you like to come and say a few more things? You could just project, Sean. All right. To get by the mic. <laughs> <laughs> what can I add about Mac? Well, I've known her for probably this whole century. <laughs> and I got to know her by not saying anything because we were sitting in silent meditation settings for, for a long time. But then to my surprise, words began to come out of her and come onto the page. And I feel a little bit like What's the right thing? I feel a little bit like a uncle to the book, or maybe a wet nurse, I don't know. Um, because I saw it a number of times along its, uh, um, during its growth and genesis to the, uh, to the fine young book it is grown up to be today. <laughs> and I guess the important thing for us to know is that uh, Mag has been writing all her life and uh, has taught writing for many years, but this having her book come out in publication is the realization of a lifelong dream. So she gets to share that dream with us. And with that, I give you Mag Diamond. This is really something I am just so mm -hmm. thrilled. I um, I have to say that my heart is really open and welcoming everybody. It's like um, there are old friends here and they're about to be friends and um, 
I want to thank everybody for being here. I want to thank Somos for hosting me. I want to thank She Writes Press for believing in the book. Uh, I want to thank Sean and Tanya for um, being the nurturers of the book that they were as I worked with them over a couple of years. And all the members of my family who showed up while I was writing it. Showed up in my head, that is. And uh, I thought I was writing one thing, and it turned out it became something entirely different. Uh, my mother and my grandmother both surfaced uh, in my mind and in my heart. And so they took a place, and it became a book about not only travel, but about what I had navigated through my life from childhood. Uh, some of it sad, some of it lovely, a great tapestry of experience. And you know, the years I spent in Taos were, were these really rich years, and, uh, and I realized a number of important things happened to me here. I just want to acknowledge them before I do anything else. Um, I found myself as a teacher. I really owned myself, um, my teacher essence. Um, I, um, I formed really deep friendships here. Um, I worked at creative uh, endeavors. I, I made jewelry and I tinkered around with all kinds of things with my hands. And importantly, I found a spiritual path a uh, really good friend back then um, who also was a body worker and some people in this room might know her, Diane Chase. She, um, she realized that I was in a place of deep suffering and she offered me the option of doing meditation. And my first reaction was, oh no, I can't do that. Oh no, that's too hard. But I but I took myself to a group. I found a little group sitting, and I went there. And that very first night, when I sat there in the dark with those people, I realized I found something true, and I found a safe place. And I realized that I'd never let go of it. So that started here. And, you know, I can't say enough about how grateful I am for that. I want to take you on a little journey now. Well, you're going to get to journey to some other places too, but we're going to have an initial journey. And what you have to do to take part in this is you have to close your eyes. And then I want you to just relax and breathe. We're in meditation land after all. And pay attention as I speak to the sensations that happen, to the thoughts, to anything that comes up. Our newfound ally swayed her monstrous head from side to side, her long trunk moving gracefully as though to music. We could hear her breathing and snorting and the fierce crunch of branches. These 14,000 pound beasts are gentle and graceful for their enormous size. They move on the ground with a light touch. Their massive stump-like feet meeting the earth's dust soundlessly. Though I had of course planned to take hundreds of stunning close-ups of the elephants of East Africa, I knew this morning I needed to set aside my camera and face this inquisitive pachyderm directly, with no filters. Just two female faces regarding one another. It took my breath away. I could detect the details in her long gray lashes and the swarming community of flies that surrounded her noble and unperturbed face. Feathery acacia leaves still hung from her mouth it seemed to be smiling at us. When I later pursued my study of elephants, I learned they possess another interesting characteristic other than intelligence and friendliness. 
and that is forgiveness. It's been rumored that they are able to forgive and trust most human beings who come in curiosity and in peace. Perhaps letting go is a better way of putting it. It seemed that this female and the others of her tribe were able in this moment to let go of their dark historical memory and accept a relationship with us. As in those rare and magical moments of falling head over heels, when all surrounding phenomena fade before our eyes, I was caught in a bubble and I lost connection with my fellow humans. Held by the gaze of this magnificent wise elephant face, I had no inkling of what was said or who said it. From the back of our Land Rover, I stared intently to impress this new feeling into my mind's eye, and I felt my heart warming. This new alliance felt strangely familiar. I had known this before, surely, in another lifetime, perhaps. The ancient face, all rough and gray and worn and beautiful, had crossed over centuries of historical time and touched a timeless and hungry female part of who I was. That most intimate piece of myself that so far had not been nurtured by my newfound love and traveling companion, Charlie, from whom I am given up my marriage. For the rest of our safari that summer, I hungered for elephants. <laughs> I'm going to show you, it's a little show and tell, this, a lot of you back there can't see this, this is a journal that uh, was given to me by my stepfather when I was 11 years old and I li we lived in Italy and um, it's, um, it's this, it was a beautiful darker green, it's now very faded. This, this was really the beginning of everything for me in writing uh, and I had another leather journal after this which was a, a blue leather one. This was journal number two. I never stopped writing. Um, I wrote at that time because I was lonely, because my mother uh, was a narcissistic person who shouldn't have ever been a mother, really. I, I found refuge in my journal, and that was a comfort to me. We lived abroad for three years, and, uh, and I never stopped writing. I mean, the journal writing continued from there on out, no matter what I did. So I always believed that there was a place to find out who I was when I was writing in my journal. And my writing career, you know, my, my, my teaching career was something that was really important to me because I was able to enable students to find their own stories and tell them, and to really believe that they had stories to tell. I was also trying to tell myself, you know, that I had stories to tell, or that I needed to tell a story. And in my late 60s, this was all slow to evolve, in my late 60s I had the light bulb moment, which was, you got to stop talking about what you're going to do, and you've got to do it. And so I happily found right to the finish. I had this dream of this collected, uh, thoughtful essay thing that I was going to do. And I went on this journey with this marvelous community of people who were also striving to do their work. And I truly believe that uh, it would not have happened had it not been for that wonderful opportunity. <coughs> So are you ready to travel some more? <laughs> We're going to start in Italy, because that's where it started. I hold an old memory now. From the haze of many years, it comes into focus. The Tuscan hills lit up in autumn in burnished golds and reds, softening my heart. As evening descended on the city of Florence and the cypresses, stood tall and proud around the old stone house on this fall day, 
our little family began to settle in for an evening in the villa. My mother had packed us up, my stepfather and me, and led us off to Italy so she could be close to art. As far as I knew, that was the reason. She'd spent several years in art school in the early 50s after we moved to San Francisco from the East and had adopted a bohemian artist path when she was married to my father. She'd been so stunning as a young woman and so conditioned to being called beautiful that she became obsessed with the idea of the beautiful life as she grew older. Or maybe she saw her future as some sort of blank canvas waiting for the white <clears throat> eyes. This dream, along with her trust fund income, brought us to the Villa di Cipressi above Florence in 1956. There had been other moves before this one, in between the uneventful divorce from my father and a quick marriage to a man she'd met while working as a cocktail waitress at the Tin Angel, the San Francisco Jazz Club. My stepfather Raymond was smart and eccentric, raised by many siblings in a poor Norwegian immigrant family in Brooklyn. He loved books and drawing and had a handsome angular face scarred by his childhood smallpox. I was becoming used to moving by this time and just put my head down and forged ahead the way I had to when she failed to explain the reasons for her choices. I don't remember being either scared or excited about moving to a foreign country thousands of miles away when I was only 11. That evening in Florence, the sun had finally gone down and we sat around our huge oval dining table as candles cast a small umbrella of light above us in the giant sala, steaming pasta with butter, a big bowl of Parmesan, a roast of pork, all perfumed with rosemary and surrounded by shiny dark zucchinis and brilliant tomatoes, and of course a salad of beautiful wild lettuce. My mother had put the red wine in a glass carafe where it shone like a ruby. She always knew how to create a beautiful picture. We even had soft white cloth napkins and white plates with little gold edges on them. As she and Raymond served up the food, they talked about how they had to find a cook and housemaid to cope with our needs, while I wondered about the unusual little school I was going to and the possibility of finding new friends there. They clinked glasses ceremoniously, and she exclaimed with a broad smile, isn't it too divine, Mag? Here we are in the most beautiful country ever. Aren't you happy, darling? <clears throat> I wasn't sure about the divine part. I hadn't fallen for this place yet. It had all happened so fast. After all, the divorce and the new husband, I just wasn't ready to be charmed. But I was just a bit curious about starting seventh grade with a bunch of American expats in an ancient Italian palazzo. She didn't wait for my answer to her question about being happy. But she turned toward my new stepfather to issue instructions about the necessary calls in the morning so we could get domestic help. Before long, we had the warm, bountiful company of our new cook, Elda, in the house. And she served us our dinner in the giant living room by candlelight a big white tureen of soup and platters of steaming eggy fettuccine, crusty scallopini alla milanese, and a perfect green salad. Ecco il pranzo, buon appetito, she denounced proudly as she beamed at my mother and the rest of us. She soon became my hero, and I followed her many afternoons after school into the kitchen and stayed to watch her do her magic there. She made creamy mayonnaise from scratch, pouring the thick olive oil into the egg with reverence and the stracciatella soup, golden chicken broth with whipped eggs in it, as well as a spaghetti carbonara, hearty peasant pasta with salt pork and egg, lots of butter and cheese. I often gave up my journal writing to sit with her in the kitchen as warm light poured through the windows from the west and I watched her gently wash the dark leaves of basil, slice the perfect tomatoes, grate the parmesan while humming a melody to herself. When she picked up a chicken to repair, she did it with joy, plumping its, patting its plump pink body with her big hands 
They were dark red from all her hard work, smearing the olive oil all over and stuffing it with the big handfuls of rosemary. Every once in a while, I accompanied on her shop or on her shopping trips and watched as she joined the animated conversation with the cheese man, the <coughs> produce lady, or the baker with his huge white flowery arms. Both of Elda's hands moved continuously to persuade and cajole, everyone's voices rising and falling. It was opera and dance right there in the morning sunshine. I learned in those moments how serious the Italians took the daily gathering of food. about India. <laughs> First we must find India. <coughs> Today our handsome Rajasthani guide Ramesh showed our great with great equanimity <coughs> showed great equanimity as he sh shepherded our vocal and primarily female group across a road that teemed with wild, colorful honking buses and loaded down bicycles weaving every which way to the small storefront with cracked yellow paint, red signage, and dirty windows. A handful of us squeezed through the narrow door, slowly adjusting our eyes to the dark, while a bitter and earthy spiced perfume greet us, greeted us Burlap bags lay everywhere. There were hundreds of dusty jars on the shelves with indecipherable writing, and of course, small containers of all kinds containing the coveted Indian spices in ochre and brown. My nose twitched and it burned, and I wanted to sneeze from all the pepper in the air. I felt breathless from the claustrophobic space, I decided to hurry along with the shopping and get out into the daylight. A woman with a modest <coughs> figure and cool composure waited outside. Her name was Michelle Drummond. She was a well-dressed young French woman married to a successful New York lawyer who'd been holding his blackberry to his ear much of the time as we marched through the ancient temple sites in Madurai and Chennai in the south. He wouldn't travel without his phone for business, she said, and that was that. The two had shared stories over dinner of exotic sounding places like Dubai and Abu Dhabi that they had visited for business and pleasure, but their tales betrayed little cultural curiosity. I watched her nervousness now in the dusty street as a few grimy faced little children stared up at her expectantly and then moved in closer. Their clothes hung unevenly on their tiny bodies their skinny arms and hands flailed every which way, making escape impossible. In crisp white linen, she looked out of place, too clean, too bright, and too white, but mostly too clean. Her long, glossy, manicured nails invited extra attention. The small beggars beseeched her for money and came in even closer, calling out, Lady, we're hungry, lady, Something for our baby sister here. Lady, give me some. Give me some money. She called out to our dignified and patient American guide who waited at the store's entrance. Get them away from me. They're so dirty. One arm rose up as if it was to cover her lovely face that looked pinched and repulsed. I wanted to turn away from her distress, but instead I kept watching as her panic fizzled into stony silence the children still swarming, and Olivier not attending to her. I'm not sure if any of my fellow travelers saw the quick scene unfold, and I can't remember how she extricated herself from the army of beggars. But before long, it had dissipated like a fragment of the day's noisy unfolding, except in my mind. Where was the compassion? So far on this journey, the chaos and pathos of India its dusty, dirty temples and marketplaces, wild street children, and scrawny cows looking for food had been slowly cracking open my heart, and I had begun to think of human deprivation in a way I never had before. Mrs. Drummond's revulsion made me uncomfortable, 
and confused. I wanted to assume she had just as much goodwill and generosity in her heart as the next person. But her panic at what was alien seemed to keep compassion at bay. We all have this fear, which is part of meeting the challenging experiences as we travel into the unknown. And it seems also we have the capacity to see foreignness for what it is and let it work its own magic, become less foreign, pass on through. It mattered not that she had traveled the globe with her successful husband and seen countless dark-skinned people in different cultures. She probably traveled everywhere first class and been cushioned from desperation. In the end, a few people heard her that day, and I imagine she tucked the whole thing away in a challenging travel experience file in her mind as she sipped her pre-dinner Chardonnay. Did Mrs. Drummond's ostensible indifference have this weight for me, I wonder, because of all the times I had passed by a homeless person on San Francisco streets with my face averted, or when I chose to buy a box seat at the opera instead of giving money to Meals on Wheels? Did hypocrisy play a part in my indignation? Now we'll take a we'll take a look at my mother from a um, from the child's from the child's eye. This is San Francisco, 1952. I remember the pungent smell of oil paint on her hands when she returned home from art school, bursting with pride. When I was about six. My mother, Madeline Violet, threw herself into studying at the California School of Fine Arts and was soon swallowed up by the community of abstract painters she worked and studied with. Before long, I was wandering through noisy parties in our little suburban tract home with the ragtag art school jazz band, jugs of gallo red, and people dancing the night away in a haze of cigarette smoke. My father and I drifted in a world apart watching the excitement from the sidelines. Mom was a small woman who painted large and heavy pictures that just about dwarfed her. She rented a studio in San Francisco where she smoked and laughed with other artists, learned how to make her own stretchers, and greedily slathered house paint on her canvases in chunks and layers. All the artists used house paint in those days because it was cheap and everyone in art school was poor except for my mother. Somehow she hauled the paintings home in her white MG and hung them on her walls, bold abstract compositions with brilliant pinks and reds, yellows and blues, occasionally remarkable zigzaggy black lines darting straight through the center like exclamation points. I remember I always wanted to touch them to moving in closer to smell the pigment, running my little fingers over the bumps and the swirls of paint. They were texture, so gritty, beautiful, and wild, and they reeked of oil paint. She was a good artist, people said, one of just a few women students at the school during the 50s, happily surrounded in that messy world by the rumpled male painters who taught there she was gone from home a lot, at some point joining the Socialist Party, <coughs> campaigning for obscure local candidates with her new artist friends. She wore black turtlenecks and very dark mascara and became a serious smoker. Whether sitting in the dining room table or at the work in her studio, I remember she always had a cigarette in her hand or dangling from her large red mouth. I watched her a lot through the smoke, thinking she was really glamorous, and began to notice she was flirting with different men here and there. And though I tried to keep an eye on things, things moved quickly, and it was difficult to fathom what would happen next. My father, on the other hand, kept it simple. 
hiding behind his newspaper in the evenings and departing for his accounting job in the city the same time every morning. During the early 50s, her paintings decorated our tract home in Belvedere, a sleepy little community on the lagoon across the bay from San Francisco. But pretty soon our physical scene shifted. I was about eight when she banished my father, her love of him now gone, and she and I left suburbia and moved into the city, closer to her newfound friends. I don't remember being surprised by this new move, not the way my grandmother was. The climate at home had become pretty chilly. Many late night arguments, some crying, my footing feeling, starting to feel shaky. She came from a family that dissembled a lot, speaking in tidy phrases that seemed empty when the going got tough. She wasn't interested in heart-to-heart -heart conversations with family members. I began to get used to a couple of things at this time. The unreliable, unreliability of her words, the continuing magic of the painting's wild designs, being alone with my fantasies and worries, eating frozen dinners, and reading a lot. <clears throat> we lived in an apartment together in the first floor of an old Victorian, and I had a dark bedroom in the back with high ceilings and not a lot of furniture. I spent a lot of time in that room, especially when she went out at night and left me with a babysitter. It's hard for me now to recall the particular moments but just a few stories from this time. The landscape of these years has become its own abstraction, a series of ever-changing blurry scenes, like my father sitting awkwardly in our kitchen holding a highball, or Rhubarb the cat, as he struggled to find an affectionate fatherly phrase. I had few guarantees then of her presence across the table at dinner or even during the afternoons when I struggled with my homework. dark of night, in the middle of winter of 2013, I pulled my long down coat tightly about me against the Adriatic cold, and I marched under the Piazza San Marco. I saw not the daylight face of Europe's grand drawing room, with beautiful women in snazzy shoes, waiters in crisp white jackets, riots of pigeons, and corny string music, but rather an expanse of dark, empty space, at the end of which stood the proud cathedral with its plump cupolas and now invisible mosaics. A few people scurried about far away, and all I could hear was the clacking of my feet on the old stone floor. It was January. I had just arrived in the city this evening, and though jet lag from many hours of airplane travel, I wanted to get my first glimpse of Venice in uncluttered form, without the usual hordes of people who camouflage the dailiness of this city. Though technically a visitor here myself, in my heart I have never felt like one. I guess because I had returned here many times as I grew into adulthood to walk these alleyways. This particular winter, I had come to witness her stripped of travelers, solitary and alone, and to investigate my own aloneness in the barren winter season. Following the social whirl of holidays with family, I looked forward to meeting my own solitude. And what better place for this than the shuttered down city of merchants and palazzos resting on murky, shifting <coughs> waters? I think of this city, I remember two movies whose stories unfold in Venice. Summertime and Death in Venice, 
in which the central figure looks for a way to warm an empty and lonely heart. Both Jane Hudson and Gustav von Aschenbach take us on a journey of seeing the landscape of Venice and bring us bring to our attention human loneliness and longing. Henry James's Wings of a Dove offers up a solitary journey as well. The mortally ill heroine leaves behind London society in order to find refuge and comfort in Venice's dark palazzos and romantic canals. I seem to carry the voices of writers with me wherever I travel. I've walked down the torturous alleys of this city many times and have seen myself as a character who must wander alone through the maze to find ease. What is peculiar about Venice in winter is how it's different it is from most other cities in Italy that generally offer up food, hospitality, and cheer. Here it is dark gray and cheerless. You don't hear voices or music ringing out. And you don't particularly feel welcome in the little claustrophobic restaurants you visit. Now you can disappear into Venetian life, feel yourself getting older by the day, slowly aging and sinking with gravity, just as the city recedes into the Adriatic, and then forge ahead to find something you've not seen before. In Venice that January, I saw my experience unfold in layers, watched myself emerge out of the gray backdrop in full relief. A small female figure in front of a shoe store that featured sequined blue high heels, a shop with glossy, colorful masks, or even simply standing to watch a lone pigeon amble along the canal. A series of fully developed photographs became realized in my mind, observer and observed right there. It all seemed black and white that January, despite the brilliant glittering glass in the shops around San Marco, or the boldly colored Missoni sweaters on skinny mannequins in the shiny elegant boutiques. The food was black and white, too. Dark ink, dark squid ink pasta, creamy risotto, pale white wine, and snowy bacala, that tangy salt cod that spreads like butter over your bread. Can't get away from the food. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> I think that's the next project, it's food. <laughs> I mean, in terms of writing. All right. Um, I'm going to read you something kooky about Vietnam. Mm -hmm. This was my first visit to Vietnam, and um, I went on sort of a private tour, and um, so I was um, had as my companion a very uh, sort of... Um, efficient but um, sort of ungenerous communicating <laughs> guide, young man. Um, I think he thought I was quite eccentric. Uh, the, the chapter in the book is called On Not Knowing Vietnam, which is sort of the theme of the whole chapter. I went to Vietnam thinking I would find out about it. I find all kinds of great insights and I came away realizing <laughs> that was kind of difficult. Um, and we find ourselves at the um, mausoleum where Ho Chi Minh is, is preserved intact. The tomb of Ho, Uncle Ho and an ancestor worship. Uh, on an overcast and pleasantly cool morning, I joined the parade of serious, reverent visitors who marched silently in single file for several blocks toward the monolithic granite mausoleum of Ho Chi Minh in the heart of Hanoi. Again, I felt alone among the Vietnamese and noticed how inherently sober the whole process felt. All this sobriety made me, made me want to wave my arms and act like a kid, or otherwise put some of my own quirkiness out into the world. I was inherently a well-behaved soul, so I just kept noting this ordered and somewhat soulless landscape. Then there was the usual irreverent chatter in my head about the strangeness of the monument the overbearing formality of the process, and the whole unfathomable notion preserving a human body intact for over 30 years. 
All the mausoleum visitors had their arms at their sides and spoke in hushed voices, if at all. Duong, my guide, relieved me of my camera and left me off at the beginning of the procession. Then I knew I wouldn't see him again until I had viewed the body and exited from the building. I felt a bit abandoned and oddly naked without the camera that had become my go-between as I traveled through all the unfamiliar little streets of Asia. My camera gives me an identity, after all, and eventually becomes a shield from the piercing gaze of those who visit. So, with no one to converse with now, I felt deprived of yet another prop. Uncharacteristically, I had done little homework on Ho, but I did know that while he was a revolutionary who made the whole world pay attention back in the 60s, he was in fact a humble personality with simple tastes for whom this kind of chauvinistic display might have been distasteful. I passed several perfect formations of young soldiers in stiff white uniforms standing guard outside, all of their very young faces lacking expression. Once inside the building and up some stairs, I entered the sanctum with its glass beer holding the 30-year-old corpse of the North Vietnamese hero dressed in his trademark khaki suit, <coughs> all pressed and clean. It was icy cold in this cavernous space, as though we had all just stepped into a refrigerator. He died in 1969 and was placed in his perpetual state by a government that boldly ignored his wishes to be cremated. <coughs> I could have sworn he had just recently laid himself down to rest, an afternoon nap perhaps, his slim little hands crossed at the waist and illuminated from a chilly white light focused his way. His sparse white beard, clean and perfectly groomed. His face looked gentle to me, with just the right amount of life in it. I wanted to ask someone, how did they do that, make him look so alive? But of course there wasn't a soul to ask. We marched around his, his figure no one saying a word, no cameras clicking, just the shuffling of feet. I tried to slow myself down to get a longer view of the man so I could imprint the strangeness of the sight on my memory. This legendary Mimit Ran, <clears throat> revered in Asia and hated in the West for over 50 years, now lay before us, looking more or less fresh and alive, while the Vietnamese people from the countryside moved by passively, as though transported on some moving sidewalk. Solemnity hung in the air, but there was no hint of ardor or faith in the visitors' faces. I felt again that spooky distance. Is it cultural or emotional? That I sometimes feel when I seek to understand Asian habits and views. I have a hard time connecting the puzzle pieces in front of me I keep wondering to myself why all these people were here. Outside the Dower Stone building, I found Duan, <clears throat> and I told him this was one of the most unforgettable sights I had ever seen in all my travels. I've never seen anything quite like this, anything quite so amazing. I'm thrilled with how weird it is, I declared, <laughs> slapping my hand on my thigh as I made the proclamation and smiling. He seemed surprised and a bit confused by my outspokenness, and then went on to tell me in his official guide speak that during the months of September and October, the Venerable Ho cannot be viewed because that's the time he has flown to Moscow to be treated. I think that's the exact word he used, treated. Did my young guide not think this was a strange fact? <laughs> that his government spent large sums of money to preserve the former leader, and a large portion of his countrymen suffered in poverty? I don't remember hearing a response to the question, which probably means I never asked him, but simply thought the thought and pondered the strangeness. I certainly wondered what old Uncle Ho, as he was affectionately called, would have thought of this spectacle. <laughs> <clears throat> he really didn't. 
by you dead. <laughs> Paris. Should we go to Paris? <laughs> Is there a little art? I was on holiday that summer with my daughter Sarah and her tribe of four. A lanky, tentative husband and three children ages 8 to 16. And I'd had the sense to rent a little apartment on the Ile Saint Louis for the two weeks so we could explore the city free of hotel constraints. On a grisly gray afternoon when walking in the Tuileries felt inhospitable, my young family decided to head off for the Eiffel Tower and I happily stepped into La Rangerie, the spacious, light-filled museum that houses the Nymphias, <clears throat> Claude Monet's giant water lilies that he bequeathed to France late in his life. When you enter these bright galleries, it feels as though you're walking into a chapel, where a bow and a prayer for art are in order. I confess to making an internal bow of my own before I feast on these vast paintings some of them over 30 feet long, canvases that completely fill the walls in two rooms of this museum. These paintings bring to life the luscious purple-green landscape of Monet's place of refuge in Giverny, a small country home where he tended a vast garden of flowers and trees and lily ponds. He built a perfect little Japanese bridge where he worked at his art. The flowers and watery landscapes surrounded him and he be became a major theme throughout his creative life. He planted a riot of flowers and pinks, oranges, reds, and purples, great numbers of wispy willow trees and beautiful stately green bushes of all kinds. He cooked for his wife in a bright blue and yellow kitchen and he worked and he worked and he worked. I went twice to La Rangerie the last time I was visited Paris and each time I breathed deeper and understood a little more about the human drive to create beauty in order to survive life's challenges. I slowed down, sat down on the wooden bench in, in each of the galleries, and I stared into the lily ponds on the canvas, the purples and blues shimmering, <coughs> the greens popping up cheerfully, and the enormous panoramas pulling me deeper as though with minimal effort I might to slide into this water and swim away. As visitors weighed down with cameras and guidebooks marched and murmured in front of me, I simply sat, staring at the lilies and the water. I've never seen paintings so big, Adela. Stand back, I wanted to say. Stand away and see the whole thing. This appears abstract, but it all becomes clearer when you step away. Honey, when are we going to meet them for lunch, did you say? Boy, my feet are killing me. For God's sakes, why don't you look at the art, I wanted to say. <laughs> Do you think we'll have time to get to Giverny? If you don't go, you'll miss the whole point of this, can't you see? Damn, I've lost my map. Oh, please pay attention, I implored silently. And then, of course, I remembered that not everyone sees the museum of art as a temple. I needed to be more patient. Bits and pieces of other lives wafted about me as I sat for an hour or more writing in my journal and staring at Monet's world of water and flowers, noticing the gently applied paint on canvas, light purple, smoothed on as though patting a cheek, applying just a hint of lavender rouge to a loved one's face. A series of tiny applied strokes felt to me like affectionate caresses from Monet's brush. This man loved his work. I remembered an evening many years ago in Paris when my artist lover, who was a painter, wept over our candlelit dinner as he reflected on the huge heart and the tireless work of Monet the artist, who labored without resting through his late seventies over what he called the Grande Decoration, persevering through the long dark years of World War I, finally <coughs> bequeathing the eight giant canvases 
to the French government. Gifts from his heart to his suffering, proud country. A couple more pieces? Mm -hmm. Now you get to meet my grandmother. <clears throat> oh, I, I should say, because um, I say that thing about my grandmother with emphasis, um, and I hadn't said anything about her before. Um, my grandmother, my father's mother, um, after whom I was named, I feel was my hero in my life, and I feel saved me uh, in, in, from uh, sort of losing my way and, and showed me what love and compassion was all about. She's one of the persons I dedicate the book to, along with my reckless, my reckless mother. Little did I know, as I lay in my twin bed in the guest room that night, listening to my grandmother read softly from the Greek myths, that I would eventually become a student who was passionate about ancient literature. The room had dusty pink walls, two identical four-poster twin beds, a pale maple dresser, and soft upholstered chairs by the bow windows. I could see from there the top of the brilliant orange Golden Gate Bridge, often draped in puffy white fog. As she read to me, turning the book to show me the illustrations, she laughed about the egotism of the gods. And it hasn't changed much over thousands of years either, she'd add with a smile, hinting that large egos still got humans into trouble. The bed sheets were always white, perfectly pressed and soft, and they smelled of lavender. I loved pulling them up around my neck and sinking into a little cocoon. Deary, do you want to hear one more? She would ask, and of course I said yes. She loved this quiet time when she bent over, <clears throat> this quiet time together, and when she bent over to kiss me goodnight, I could feel the cool dampness of her cheeks from tears that sometimes fell from her eyes. Not from sadness, but from a defective tear duct, I think. She'd been ill with infantile paralysis as a young child, and it had permanently changed the face, elongating her cheeks and her jaw and causing her mouth to slant downward. She had lived gracefully with this misshapen face since she was two, around the time she also lost her mother to TB. We both found motherly love during these evenings, something neither one of us had really had before. I was the daughter she never had, and she surrounded me with a mother's love always. She left the bathroom light on for me and the door ajar because I was frightened of the dark, and she reminded me I could come and get into her bed any time during the night. My grandfather always slept in a separate bed, a little gray cell-like room next to mine, where he snored away as softly as the foghorns that moaned outside through the night. <laughs> Grandmother liked to take a bath in the morning before she dressed, and I often sat in the bathroom with her, watching her add bubble bath that smelled like old roses. I sat there and I watched her slowly move her naked body that looked pretty old to me then, with its sagging pink breasts and sparse pubic hair. She paid little attention to her naked body, I guess, because as a child she'd been trained in modesty and circumspection. Once she settled into the glittering bubbles in the tub, I'd ask her about where we were, when we were going to the symphony, or maybe I'd nudge her to tell me about her life studying the piano in the 20s. I was curious about all the parts of her past she didn't talk about and suspected she'd given up a lot to marry my chilly grandfather. As I got older, I wondered whether she felt she had missed out on the path of a serious pianist and a woman with a life of her own. As we continued our morning bathroom conversation, I'd play idly with the different flower-shaped soaps at the side of the sink and held her fluffy white towel for her while she luxuriated in the steaming hot bath water her long face getting pinker by the moment. Many decades later, she would, then 89 and blind, 
take a fall in this same bathtub into scalding hot water that would burn her across much of her frail body. And no one, not her granddaughter or her housekeeper, Angelina, could be there to prevent it. This fall came at what she knew was the final part of her life. <clears throat> she was approaching 90, and she was weary, had outlived most of her friends, and had been preparing in her private way to die for quite some time, feeling deeply the losses of old age. In the several weeks that followed the fall in the tub, she appeared to move seamlessly from suffering inside her torched skin as doctors bustled about, suggesting pointless solutions, to letting go of therapeutic measures and receding peacefully and happily with her family's love and good wishes into unconsciousness and quiet death. I realize the last piece is all about death too. Are you up for it? <laughs> sure. I mean, we are we are around the day of the dead time, aren't we? <laughs> I mean, I think the the uh, somebody once asked me why, what what my fascination with death was. Somebody that I had worked with in the beginning who pretended to be a publicist and ended up not doing a very good job, and she said, "You seem you seem to be consumed by death," and I said, "Well, you know, the death happened. I mean, death is 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 part of the whole." It's part of the whole game. I mean, it's 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 all around us, and it's what we face. And um, and in, and death comes in so many forms: losing people, and I mean, losing not only losing people to actual death, but losing people in other ways. Um, and I and I did, uh, which I hadn't mentioned, and it was an important part of my life. Um, I worked for 10 years as a uh, volunteer uh, caregiver, a uh, hospice caregiver. So I spent a lot of, I, I had a great opportunity to learn about uh, the whole journey of dying. And it was, uh, it was an amazing organization called Zen Hospice Project in San Francisco. Uh, it was one of the, you know, a huge, big gift to, to me in my life. And also part of my my spiritual practice. A mother returns. Very early, the, fo the morning following our visit to the prison. Oh, I should say, sorry, this takes place in this all happened unfolds in Cambodia. <clears throat> Very early, the morning following our visit to the prison, I awoke suddenly from a dream so vivid, I thought. I had just come from the bedside of my dying mother, now gone over 20 years. A woman who had suffered deeply, who had lost her faith in life, she died alone in a San Francisco hospital with a bloated liver, seized up lungs, and an abiding terror. I had tried to get to her bedside, traveling on two planes across various states, but I missed my chance to hold her hand before she died. In my Phnom Penh dream, I was entering a lovely bedroom in my grandmother's old house, a place where I'd spent so many comforting years. My mother reclined on pillows, right on the edge of dying, looking more radiant and beautiful than she had most of her life. Her face, with the dramatic high forehead, was luminous, and although she was entirely bald and pale white, her velvet brown eyes were still strong. I could almost smell the lavender lotion she loved. But no, that was part of the time when she lived. She was now fading away, skeletal, serene. On the verge of dying, she stared at me with loving awareness, as though she were about to say these words, I love you, Meg. We both smiled at one another, though no words were spoken that I can remember and the moment stretched out beautifully. Each of us knew exactly where we were, and it felt so good to be in each other's company. Now in my air-conditioned hotel room on this humid morning, my body felt both chilled 
and calm as I awoke and pondered the gift of this dream. It was as though my sleep that night had been visited by a procession of Cambodian skulls and bones and floating spirits who had never found their rest on earth. And they had brought my dying mother back to me so she and I could finally find some peace. I felt gratitude's warmth deep in my body and in my mind an unsettling irony that it was in this very country where many thousands of citizens fought with every fiber of their being to survive war and torture that my confused and heartsick mother who cared so little for her life that she slowly killed herself finally came back to me. My mother died alone in a hospital room in San Francisco in the middle of the night. The date was December 1, 1991. As I traveled to arrive at her bedside from my home in New Mexico over a thousand miles away, I repeated stubbornly to myself, I must reach her. <clears throat> she will see me now, will know me in the end, I kept promising myself. There was one phone call with a hospital doctor midway through the journey, where he told me she was coming out of ICU and showed signs of improvement. I remember that I said to him, please tell her I'm coming. It's important that she know. I spent a restless night in a hotel before taking another plane to San Francisco. Then there was a second call when I was changing planes in Phoenix. I was on my way, I said, as I stood at the airport payphone. But mom's sister-in-law's flat voice on the other side of the phone told me she was dead. She died at two in the morning in the hospital, she said flatly. And I thought, she died in the dark and alone. <laughs> I stood there absolutely still in that unfamiliar airport on Thanksgiving weekend where masses of travelers hurried onward, and I felt all the sounds around me move through my body. Little children's pleading voices, twangy PA announcements, people talking fretfully as they marched, and the relentless clacking of roller bags on concrete. I put the phone down empty-hearted. My breathing was so shallow, I could hardly find it. My mind flailed in confusion, not understanding. How do you understand that your mother who gave you life is gone for good? It felt as though my physical body were disappearing in all the confusion. I stood still for a while, rooted in place and waited for something to come. Tears of grief, some kind of plan, something. But there was nothing. Then I remembered something deeply familiar from my years of living with her. It was her voice saying, Dearie, when things get really tough, just find the nearest bar and order a drink and then everything will get better. <laughs> yes, I would honor her passing through her own method of choice. I would feel closer to, I would feel her closer to me then and not have to imagine her lying cold and frightened in the dark. I'm pretty sure she did not let go of life peacefully. She had a Dylan Thomas kind of mind, she and her third husband, Peter, who had died just three years before after a lifetime of abuse. Do not go gentle into that dark night. There was nothing gentle about the way those two had cared for themselves. I wasn't rushing to her bedside on Thanksgiving weekend to ask her to choose life over death for my children who loved her, for herself, or for the love I silently carried for her. I knew it was too late for this stay alive conversation. She had long ago made her choice against life. Even so, I had wanted her to know I was going to show up, to sit with her through the night and even hold her hand and tell her I loved her. It seemed like the least I could do because you see there was just a small chance she had taken that kind of loving care of me during some dark nights when I was little. 
a time too far away for me to remember anymore. Sadly, I would never know whether the doctor on the phone took seriously my plea to tell her I was coming. A few weeks later, I found a way to make some peace with her that brought her ashes home in a pink plastic bag from the Neptune Society, and I placed them on the coffee table in my small apartment. Some ritual was called for, but what would it look like? I didn't know. She certainly had never taught me. I wanted to run my fingers through her pebbly ashes, which I imagined would feel warm like beach sand to dig in and to touch what remained of her and see if there were any remnants of the gold wedding band she had refused to give up. Then a little know-it-all voice whispered, no, no, not that. So instead I quietly sent love to her, remembering some of the sweet moments of our life together. My 10th birthday in the snowy mountains of Tahoe, our visits to feed the wild cats in the Colosseum in Rome. <clears throat> How fun it was to dance around the dining room to Dixieland records pretending we were wild women. Then I wished her safe passage. She needed that, I figured. She stayed in the room with me for a while, filling up the living room with her restlessness and faded perfume. It was cocktail time, after all. <laughs> Perhaps I'd been afraid that feeling her grit and ashes on my hands would force me to see she was nothing anymore, just dust. And that would deepen the hollow place in my chest. Tears would finally come, and I'd have a hard time sealing the urn correctly so she could be transported home to New York to be buried beside her mother in the family plot in Long Island. That December evening was so quiet and gentle, so perfect. I finally lit a cigarette in her honor and toasted her with a generous glass of Chardonnay. As the sky beyond the Golden Gate Bridge softened into a beautiful pink sunset that would have made her very happy. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Anybody has any questions? <laughs> Happy to answer if I can. Yeah. You thought you were going to write um, a collection or, or have published a collection of essays. Right. It became a memoir. Why? <coughs> well, it was, a, it was an uncanny process, and I think it was happening while I started to work with Right to the Finish, but I. I had this vast collection of, of journals, travel journals, and I was, you know, I was, I was culling these, I, mean, I was using material from these journals, and I was um, deciding I was going to write these brilliant essays. Um, and I started with, I can't remember which particular journal, you know, which particular place. But my mother started, my mother showed up, and my mother wanted her story told. And, and then, you know, I started to I started to write about something else, and, uh, and, and I remembered my grandmother. I remembered what, how my grandmother uh, was responsible for teaching me piano, and I, want, I needed to honor my grandmother, and, and I needed to recognize that, in fact, my grandmother had been, a, been this major force of, for the good in my life. So, so it needed to be more than just these witty stories about adventures in foreign countries and, and about, like, why did I get myself to India? Or why did, why, why did Paris, why does Paris have a lock on my heart, which it does? Um, and it's because of my past. You know, the, the, the Paris has a lock on my heart because it's so much about art for me and, and history. And, I lived around art all my life, and 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 India just just captivated me and, and made me so so confused but so 
uh, compelled to understand because in India I faced this world of duality of this of people living in a world of duality and I, I looked at the caste system and I and I had been I had been living amongst people who thought they were different than other people. I, I you know, grew up in a in, in a wealthy family and they thought they were different. So I looked I had that in my life. That was a question. You see, does that make sense? Yeah. So the threads I tried to have. I mean, there were threads for every place that I talked about. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and some of it had to do with my spiritual practice, and or my, 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 you know, my sort of searching blindly in the beginning, or thinking I wasn't going to have a spiritual practice. But I have a chapter on Burma that's very important because it shows how at home I was in a country where spiritual practice was everything. Yeah, um, you, I think you mentioned earlier about um, being an observer, about listening to your stories. I, I thought about, it's just interesting, you know, why did you travel or why does one travel to discover yourself? And it seemed that you were often discovering your own history versus discovering yourself. Be I don't know, were you also becoming someone new? Oh, Can no. I, just talk uh, about that? I don't. Well, I think I was becoming a more, uh, a fuller person, um, but new, I don't think so. Um, the, I often, when I traveled, was able to see myself in the landscape I was traveling in, and I was able to sort of view myself from the outside, as well as be very aware of what was going on inside. But, but I really believe that the, my curiosity to travel came out of spending all those years of my life writing in a journal and being so curious about the world. Uh, and I came across a great uh, travel writer called Paul Thoreau, many of you probably know, and he wrote once that, that, that he travels all the time in order to find out who he is. That he, he, he learns who he is again and again when he shows up in certain places, you know? Makes sense. Absolutely. It makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. Questions? More? Yeah? Um, I mentioned to the person sitting next to me when I first got here, I thought there would be a slideshow and screens of, <laughs> of the images of her travels and Clearly, it's not needed with your words. I'm now able to be transported. Thank you. Thank you very much. There are there are some images in the center of the book. <laughs> your mind, but um, but that's some of the pride I take in my work is that me. I think the sensory world for me is is absolutely paramount, and I think that goes back to my childhood. I think I, I loved beautiful things, and I loved the way things smelled and the way they looked, and and, and, and you know, and I was exposed to a lot of, I was exposed to beautiful things too, so I cultivated that. Thought about it. Thanks. Questions? Do you have any of your mother's paintings? I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're very important in my life. Yeah, I have not many of her paintings survived because she didn't take very good care of them. But um, but I do have a, a, a small collection of them, and I and they bring her back into my life. You know, um, when I look at them, I I remember you know I remember being that child watching her go through that transformation that she did. And I think I wouldn't be the person that obsessed about Monet if I hadn't been surrounded by amazing abstract paintings when I was growing up. I think there's obviously a connection there. <laughs> yeah, I'm so grateful for that. I think to love art is, it's just, it's just, it's a great thing to have in your life. 
Thank you so much. Thank and you. I will, I'm happy to, to, if anybody's bought books, I'm happy to sign, you know, do the yes. ceremonial thing. And I'd <laughs> be very happy to do that. Maybe I'll get off this perch. So we just, <laughs> Thank you.